Hi, my name is Bartlo Pla. I would like to share my understanding of stellar aberration, which is an effect that produces the apparent displacement of celestial objects. Nearby objects, such as the Moon or objects on Earth, are not subject to stellar aberration. The following picture shows what would happen if we could turn on or off the effect of aberration. Have a look. This leaves us with the question where the effect of stellar aberration takes place. Does it take place near the observer on Earth or is it something that occurs in space? Let's have a look. In this illustration, light is coming from the top and goes straight down to the Earth. The Earth itself moves with the orbitable motion of 30 km per second. The telescope is tilted to make sure the light will pass through the telescope. So if we look at the image, light passes through the telescope. As a consequence, light will have appeared to come from a different direction. And the way it's calculated is it goes as follows. The speed of light is 300,000 km per second. The motion of Earth is 30 km per second. And the resulting aberration term is 20.4 arc seconds. Let's now have a look how the aberration is calculated for the planets, for the Moon and for the Sun. For Venus it's calculated as follows. Speed of light is 300,000 km per second. The motion of the Earth is 30. The motion of Venus is 35 km per second. The difference is 5. And the resulting aberration term is 3.7 arc seconds. It has a minus sign because the aberration is in the opposite direction from the distant stars. For the Moon, we don't have any aberration, which we can explain as follows. The motion of the Earth is 30. The Moon goes with the same speed as the Earth. No difference, no aberration. And for the solar aberration, the speed of light 300,000. The Earth goes with 30. The Sun itself doesn't have a velocity. The difference is 30 and the resulting aberration term is 20.4 arc seconds. We can visualize the difference in aberration as follows. We do have from the top to the bottom the different planets from the solar system and to the left we noted the velocity. The higher the difference in velocity between the Earth and the observed planet, the higher the corresponding aberration term. For planets that go faster than the Earth, we do see a negative aberration term, which means the aberration is observed in the opposite direction. Time for a number of interesting questions. Let's have a look. Transits and occultations occur at the moment when the apparent images of celestial bodies overlap with each other. The question is why the apparent images and not the images as they come from their true direction. Let's look at the situation for Venus. There was a Venus transit on June 8, 2004. Without aberration we would have seen the following. With the effect of aberration we saw something else. The two images are different by an amount of 24.1 arc seconds which is the combination of the constant aberration of the Sun of 20.4 arc seconds and 3.7 arc seconds for the planet Venus, which is in the opposite direction. Now, when there is such a transit, there are no photons emitted by Venus. There aren't, there isn't such a thing as black photons. The only thing we see are photons from the Sun which are missing from the image over here. Now, how can the missing photos from the Sun have become subject to the aberration of Venus? Now let's look at an occultation. This is the occultation of Jupiter by the Moon. Now, the question is the following. If you do have Jupiter with aberration and the Moon without aberration, then 
if Jupiter is behind the moon, how can we see the planet if it's already behind the moon? Another question was raised by George Airy. He filled a telescope with water, knowing that the speed of light in water is lower than the speed of light in air. Now, he expected to see a larger aberration term by filling the telescope with water. But the end result was that there was no difference at all. So why does a telescope filled with water show no difference in aberration? Let's have a look how Einstein looked at the effect of aberration. Einstein came up with a different formula for aberration, but even more important, he put things in the context of the reference frame of the observer. In our case, the reference frame of the Earth. The picture here shows the GPS satellites from the perspective of the Earth initial frame. The Earth initial frame is an important concept in GPS technology because it's the frame in which the speed of light is the constant c. The Earth itself is rotating relative to the Earth initial frame and the ECI, the Earth initial frame itself, is rotating against the Sun. Let's have a look. Let's now consider how this impacts the way we look at the aberration of light. On the left hand side we do have the explanation as per the theory of Bradley. On the right hand side we do have the concept of the inertial frame of the Earth. Now in the left hand image we do give light the speed of light 300,000 km per second plus the 30 km per second of the orbital motion of the Earth. So, the left-hand picture is in contradiction with the constancy of speed of light relative to the inertial frame of the Earth. Now, as a consequence, if we see illustrations such as the umbrella in the rain or the telescope that is on a moving Earth platform, these concepts, these illustrations, cannot be reflecting the true physics behind stellar aberration. We can now put this in the context of the Michelson-Morley experiment, which as an outcome showed that the speed of light doesn't reveal the motion of the Earth. It was based on the following hypothesis. There is a medium to which light propagates and the Earth moves through this medium. And by moving through the medium, one should see a difference of the speed of light depending on the time of the day or the time of the year. Now, the original article describing the version, the improved version of the Michelson Morley experiment, is available at the following URL and is the following document. Now, the first page of the document starts with a reasoning around the aberration of light and further down even speaks about the water telescope. So if the aberration of light was a reason to expect the outcome that was raised, why were they then using a local light source that is not subject to stellar aberration? Michelson together with Gale performed another version of the experiment whereby they looked for the speed of light and the rotation speed of the Earth. They had a very large interferometer and the outcome of the experiment was that indeed the angular velocity of the Earth was, could be measured as a variation of the speed of light. Now this experiment is described as to be compatible with both the idea of a stationary ether and special relativity. Now let's focus on special relativity. This is about the reference frame of the Earth. 
The reference frame of the Earth, there we know that it is static and has the same fixed direction towards remote stars. And the Earth rotates relative to this reference frame. And that's basically what has been measured as part of the Michelson-Gale experiment. Now, this angular velocity of the Earth itself is reflected through diurnal aberration. And it can be calculated as follows. Diurnal aberration is due to the rotation of the Earth about its own axis. Speed of light is 300,000 km per second. The rotation of the Earth is 464 m per second at the equator. And the resulting aberration at the equator is 0.32 arc seconds. One remark, as opposed to annual aberration, diurnal aberration applies to both starlight and moonlight. Let's get back to the original question, where aberration takes place. Does it take place near the observer on Earth, or does it take place in space? My take on this is that it takes place in space. The velocity of the planets depends on their distance from the Sun, and is dependent on the following formula. Its square root, g, being the gravitational constant, the mass of the Sun, divided by the distance from the Sun. Now, let's assume that space itself also rotates around the Sun, with the exact same speed as the planets, so with the exact same formula. In that case, the formula for aberration can be applied incrementally as light moves through space with different orbital velocities, then light is forced to follow a curved path. We can see this as follows. This is in simulation with Excel. We have starlight. So we say this is the true direction of starlight. And if we simulate it, then what's going to happen is that star light follows a curved path. And at the position of the Earth, which is here, it looks as if the star is coming from this direction. It's not up to scale, but it's to show the principle. So starlight is coming from this direction, following a curved path, and it looks as if light is coming from this angle. Let's now consider the motion of the solar system itself. The motion of the solar system, which is 217 km per second, is the reason why we have something called secular aberration. The speed of light is 300,000, the motion of the solar system 217, and the resulting aberration 149 arc seconds, which is quite significant. If planets or the moon would have been subject to this amount of aberration, we would certainly have noticed this. But this is not something that uh, was reported. So secular aberration must also occur in space while light enters the solar system. And as a consequence, secular aberration does not apply to objects from within the solar system. As a conclusion, I'm showing the same picture as I showed at the beginning. Here we see the moon, with right next to it a very bright star. And the star is visible with the effect of stellar aberration, the way we look ourselves through all of the stars. This is the same picture, but without stellar aberration. And now, the same very bright star has disappeared behind the moon. So how can this very bright star become visible with the effect of stellar aberration? This can't be an effect that happens on the Earth. It can only be an effect that takes place in space. Light from the star will, at the moment it passes the moon, travel side by side and follow the exact same path than light reflected by the moon. So both will come together at the observer on Earth. If you look at the picture here, we see that light from the planet Jupiter, which includes stellar aberration, and light from the moon, 
without aberration, light from Jupiter at the moment it passes the Moon will travel side by side towards the observer on Earth. Thinking about the Waterfields telescope, George Airy expected to see a larger amount of stellar aberration for a telescope filled with water. This did not happen, and the reason is obvious. Stellar aberration is an effect that takes place in space, so there is no reason why there would be an increased level of stellar aberration observed with a telescope filled with water. Now thinking about the Venus transit. We don't see photons from the planet Venus, but we see light coming from the Sun behaving exactly the same way as the aberration that is applicable to planet Venus. And this can only be the case that light from the Sun at the moment it passes the planet Venus will show and follow the exact same path than light transmitted from the planet Venus. So this concludes the presentation and I hope I was able to clarify my perspective on where the effect of stellar aberration takes place.